Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for part three of the Link Together Coping in Quarantine series, brought to you by the Harbor Area Chapter of the Links Incorporated. My name is Natalie Natal, and I am pleased to be your moderator for today. As we navigate life during this global pandemic, this webinar series is, to desi is designed to educate the community on a variety of topics on mental health, navigating unemployment, finances, and more. Whether you are joining us for the first time or you have been a loyal participant to our Link Together series, we welcome you and we hope that you find this session both engaging and informative. At this time, I want to acknowledge the leaders in our organization. At the helm of the LinkedIn organization uh, from a national perspective is Dr. Kimberly Leonard Jeffries and our Western Area Director, Ms. Lorna Hankins. We want to acknowledge her as she has been a fantastic supporter of our Link Together series. So before I get started today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping tips. First, please note that this session will be recorded and will be available on the Harbor Area Chapter of the Links Incorporated website upon conclusion of this webinar series. Since this is a webinar, all participants are on mute and, uh, and videos will be shown, uh, except on all videos will not be shown except for the panelists and the moderator. And even though this is a webinar, we really want this to be as interactive as possible. As such, we will be taking your questions through the web, throughout the webinar. Please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your computer screen or mobile device. Also, at the end of this session, a survey link will pop up for you to fill out. We would love to hear your feedback. We have been really using this feedback to improve upon our webinar week after week. And if you're unable to provide feedback at this time, don't worry, you'll also get a link via email. And finally, for those who are active on social media, please use hashtags HAC links and link together series to share your thoughts, takeaways, and comments. So with that, let's get started. We are in a time where you can't turn on the TV or go down the street without being reminded about COVID-19. We also know that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting many of our Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities and is further exacerbated at the intersections of class, gender, and age. While there is a lot of information available on coronavirus, preventative measures, and the like, there is also a lot of misinformation that is being widely circulated among our communities. I'm reminded of the HIV epidemic in which many in our communities felt that they wouldn't get the disease because it initially emerged amongst gay white men in America. And yet today, HIV has disproportionately affected the black community in a way that we maintain the highest rates of infection amongst all racial groups. As such, we want to use this platform to dispel some of those myths in our communities around COVID-19 and provide knowledge and wisdom from those that are actively working in the field. Which brings me to my very special guest, Dr. Valerie Green Amos and Professor Marion Thornton White. First, here we have with us Dr. Valerie Green Amos, who currently serves as a physician director for healthcare partners for the Long Beach community overseeing practices in Compton, Long Beach, and Downey, California. Dr. Green Amos has over 18 years of managed care and primary care expertise, including physician management, chronic disease management, risk adjustment, culturally competent care, clinic leadership, and patient satisfaction. Prior to her current role, Dr. Green Amos served as the National Medical Director at Molina Healthcare Incorporated and president at Molina Medical Group in Long Beach, California. Prior to relocating to Los Angeles, Dr. Green Amos served as a director of clinical outreach at Westside Family Health Incorporated in Wilmington, Delaware. At Westside, she served as a Spanish speaking population as a National Health Service Corps Scholar. Dr. Green Amos completed her residency in family medicine with a concentration in geriatrics at the University of Maryland Medical Center, 
holds a medical doctorate from Temple University of Medicine and a bachelor's degree in biology pre-medicine from Spelman College. Dr. Green Amos is board certified in family medicine and is a bilingual Spanish speaking physician. She and her husband have been residents of Long Beach since 2007. Dr. Green Amos is currently the president of the Lynx Incorporated Harbor Area Chapter and a member of numerous organizations, including the American Academy of Family Physicians, California Academy of Family Physicians, National Medical Association, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Orange County Chapter, and the National Association of Spelman College, Los Angeles Chapter and she is a member of the Antioch Church of Long Beach, California. Dr. Green Amos, welcome. Thank you. We also have with us Professor Marion Thornton White, who currently serves as a clinical nursing director with the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services Ambulatory Care Network. She has a 40-year career in nursing serving underrepresented communities in, I'm sorry. <laughs> in New Orleans, Los Angeles, and uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Los Angeles, California. She oversees nursing operations at South Los Angeles Health Group and Coastal Health Group. Marin has an extensive uh, public health background working maternal child health programs and Department of Children and Family Services. She serves as an adjunct nursing professor at Los Angeles Southwest College. Mrs. Thornton White is recognized as a thought leader in the field of nursing and serves as a mentor to student nurses as well as her staff. Prior to her role as clinical nursing director, Marion coordinated the Black Infant Health Program, the Sudden Infant Death Syndrome Program, and the Fetal Infant Mortality Review Program for Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. She served as a contributing writer on how to lower the risk of SIDS in the African American community, an initiative sponsored by the California State Department of Health Maternal Child Health Branch. She and her other professional colleagues received numerous grants from the Office of Substance Abuse Prevention to operate programs for pregnant substance abusers at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic in Los Angeles County. Mrs. Thornton White is a member of numerous organizations, including the Lynx Incorporated Harbor Area Chapter, where she serves as a National Planning Committee member for the 42nd National Assembly and on the Executive Board of the Harbor Area Chapter, serving as a protocol chair. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, where she has served as a chapter president and California State Coordinator. She is also involved in numerous other organizations, including Sigma Theta Tau, International Nursing Honor Society, Association of California Nurse Leaders, Council of Black Nurses, Los Angeles Chapter, Chi Eta Pi Sorority Incorporated, Mu Chi Chapter, Dillard University Professional Nurse Association, National Association of Leadership and Success, Black Women for Wellness Community Advisory Board, Healthy African American Families Community Advisory Board, the American Cancer Society, and the American Public Health Association. Professor Marion Thornton White, we welcome here, you here tonight. Thank you, so happy to be here. <laughs> and I guess I should say a little bit about myself. Um, as your moderator for this evening, I'll just share a little bit. Um, as mentioned before, I'm Natalie Natal, and I work as a Guided Pathways Regional Coordinator in the California Community College's Chancellor's Office, serving the Los Angeles and Orange County region. I'm also a doctoral candidate at the University of Southern California, Rossier School of Education. I too am a member of the Harbor Area Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, and I'm also the chair of the Harbor Area Lynx Emergency Response Team that is responsible for bringing you this four-part webinar series. I'm very happy to be with you today, and I hope that you all have a fantastic experience this evening. So without further ado, let's hear from our experts to give us some current information on COVID-19 and key statistics for us to be aware of. As our panelists are talking, feel free to uh, use the Q&A function, as I mentioned before, to ask us some questions. So Dr. Green Amos, I will start with you. Uh, what is the latest information that we have on coronavirus and what, what can you tell us? Well, Natalie, thank you so much for the really amazing introduction. 
I think that we as a community have a lot of responsibilities today and our hope, myself and my dear friend, Professor Marion White, we will be able to shed some light on the realities of this virus. Um, it, it's really clear that there's been a lot of misinformation shared in the community. Um, some of that extreme misinformation coming from the President of the United States. So our goal today not only is to help our communities understand the truth versus the fiction, but also provide a dialogue, a dialogue for which if you have a question, we can help to provide you a solution and an answer that may protect yourself and also your community. What we know is that the United States is facing something that they've never seen before. We've never seen a pandemic like what we're experiencing with COVID-19. Um, as of today, the death rate has increased. This slide was provided just yesterday, but the United States does have over 1.5 million cases. And part of the reason for the increase in case, uh, case ratio or case rate comes from the fact that states like California and others are starting to open universal testing. So in Southern California, in particular Los Angeles County, um, anyone at this point, if they're interested in getting tested, can be tested. So when we're looking at those numbers, they do include a number of individuals throughout the United States that are asymptomatic. But unfortunately, we also know that as of today, there's over 91,000 deaths, people who have unfortunately died because of the COVID-19 virus. What we know is that overall, the disproportionate number of these individuals have been senior citizens with a number of comorbid conditions. They, we also know that the first large scale cases were of those individuals living in skilled nursing facilities. And that continues to be a very, very significant source of deaths. So for individuals who are living in these skilled nursing facilities, many of these facilities have had outbreaks. And because of that, many individuals have succumbed to the virus because of their already compromised immune systems and having a number of different comorbid disorders. And when we speak of comorbidity, it's really important that you're aware that we're talking about the diseases that disproportionately affect people of color. They exist in people of every ethnicity and every background, but we're talking about things like hypertension, obesity, which actually seems to be the number one risk factor for having significant sequela or complications from COVID-19, as well as diabetes and heart disease. So again, we know that these particular problems disproportionately affect our communities. And so we're seeing that people who are having those problems and conditions are unfortunately affected by this virus. And then their respiratory systems are not able to combat the virus in such a way, their immune systems are not able to combat the viruses in such a way that most of these persons are dying from respiratory failure. The highest, however, hospitalization rates are not actually on the coast. As we know, there's been two different strains identified of this virus. One particular strain came from the Far East. So the concept around the fact that this particular virus all came from China is not necessarily accurate. The first cases were certainly identified in China and those cases affected the West Coast. So here in California, we know that there was a number of individuals who were on cruise ships and people who've been traveling as early as January who came from Asia who did have coronavirus. And then unfortunately, that virus dis disseminated amongst our communities and made its way into the West Coast of the US. But what we know about the East Coast is that many of the individuals who were responsible for um, having the virus transmitted were actually people who had traveled from Europe. So Europeans who had been, uh, or Americans who had been traveling and vacationing in Europe also brought a particular strain of coronavirus here to the United States shores and affected a number of individuals in the New York, New Jersey area, which is why we saw such incredibly high numbers of individuals in those communities affected. But because of the resources and the ability for fast and quick action, specifically by the local governments in the West Coast states, as well as the East Coast states, we have seen what's called a flattening of the curve. So though there were significant large amounts of individuals who contracted the virus and had many different manifestations of the virus. And I, I want to note here that most people who contract the virus, over 85% 
do not have any symptoms, which is why testing has become such an important factor because what we're hopeful about is that if individuals are aware that they're positive for this virus, that they will self-isolate so that they will not be spreading the virus to other people in their community. That would be their coworkers, that would be their family members, that would be their friends, and that would just be people that come across these individuals out and about in our society. But again, unfortunately, that was something that was left upon individual states to make recommendations. And again, here on the West Coast in California, those particular um, governors were very, very quick to make uh, a statement to the community to encourage and to ensure social distancing by basically shuttering a number of businesses and making uh, precautionary statements about how people needed to move in the community, but essentially stay safe at home. Similarly, on the East Coast, New York City, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and, and Connecticut developed a consortium of leaders, local leaders, that were responsible for trying to ensure that those communities also, especially in light of how close in contact people live, especially in New York City and North Jersey, Northern New Jersey, people live in such close contact, it was very important that those safer at home distancing protocols were very, very clear and sharp early in the disease. And so early in the, this pandemic, excuse me. So as we know, those particular uh, manifestations and recommendations did coincide with a stabilization of the hospitalization rates. But what we know now is that the highest hospitalization and death rates are actually in the rural South. So areas like Mississippi and Louisiana are seeing uh, just astronomical numbers of people of color in particular, but also others who have been not only exposed to this virus, but have had to be hospitalized and vent on ventilators in order to ensure their survival. But even with those many different medical support opportunities, many individuals in those areas have unfortunately lost their lives to COVID-19. So as we've moved through this particular experience, this pandemic, now that we're two months and almost in some instances, more than two months from the initial uh, safe at home precautions, many states are now starting to relax their reopening requirements, which means that they're allowing for individuals to go out into the community. And what we know is that the virus is still prevalent. What we know is that people are still dying every single day. So though the state governments may suggest that you can go out in the community, it is really important that you heed the advice and wisdom of people who are trying to protect you and me, and that's to continue to stay safe at home, to minimize your contact in the community, to wear your facial mask, to wear gloves when indeed possible, and protect yourself and others from this virus. So the challenge is, well, what can we do? What can we do now that we know the virus is continuously spreading? Well, we have to just exercise safety and precautions. That's what we can do. We have to advocate in our community for the best things for our community. We know that we have disproportionate rates of hypertension and diabetes and other comorbid disorders. So we are the ones that really need to stay <laughs> safe at home. And indeed, we know that there's been so much talk about vaccines. Vaccines, will be something that in the near future, and I say near future because our hope is that there will be a vaccine available in early 2021, but it would be um, unprecedented, I'll say, for us to have a vaccine available in the United States for use against this particular virus in 2020. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, it would just be a very aggressive yeah. calendar if we were able to see that. But in the US, if you go to the next slide, I'll just speak quickly about the, the vaccines. There are two particular large pharmaceutical entities working on vaccines in the United States. The first being Pfizer, and Pfizer has a multi-city trial going on um, involving New York City and Baltimore, Maryland, as well as in Germany. And they have some promising information, but they have not released any public results or statistics around what their vaccine um, has proven to do thus far. On the other hand, a pharmaceutical company in the US named Moderna has released information on their COVID-19 vaccination trial. So as you can see from this particular slide, 
there's not a large number of individuals in the study. Pfizer promoted that perhaps there were 300 individuals in their study. Moderna only has 45 patients, but of those 45 patients, all of them did develop antibodies and antibodies are those cells that are necessary to fight the virus. Not only did they express antibodies, but eight of those patients showed actual virus killing capabilities, which means that when the persons were exposed to the actual COVID-19 virus, that the vaccine was proven strong enough and effective enough, excuse me, to actually kill the virus. So though we know that this information is promising, as you realize the global community is looking for this vaccine, not just the United States, and having such a small number of individuals in the testing phase means that we are far from having an answer regarding vaccines. But at least we know that the Federal uh, Drug Administration and the federal government for which monitors these vaccines will allow for an accelerated process in hopes that these vaccines could help Americans protect themselves from the next wave of COVID-19. But for now, what we need to do again is practice aggressive hygiene, social distancing, and common sense. Next thank slide, please. You. Oh, thank, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So I'll turn things over to um, our my dear friend Professor White. But I just wanted to share that in our area in Los Angeles County, she'll talk about um, the racial and ethnic challenges are very very clear. There are more Black and Brown folks affected by this virus than there are of the Caucasians by capita, meaning by percentage. So it's my pleasure to lend my, uh, my voice to my dear friend, Professor Marion Thornton White, as we dig deeper into the statistics around this virus. Thank you, Dr. Valerie Green Amos. Next slide. Okay, so when um, COVID-19 first hit the U.S., we saw the impact that the disease had on the city, on the state, actually, of New York. Um, California, more or less, uh, you know, we didn't go through the surge and have as many problems as uh, New York had because I think our governor and our public health officials were forward thinking, but we do, Los Angeles County does have the largest number of COVID-19 cases in the state of uh, California. So if you look at the cities that are impacted, and pretty much what I did was, um, you know, selected cities where uh, a lot of African Americans live in California, in Southern California in particular. So uh, the city of Carson, there are uh, 344 cases. The city of Compton has 358 cases. Hawthorne has 305 cases. The city of Inglewood has 480 cases. Lancaster, 469. Linwood, 333. Palmdale, 566. Pomona, 298. Los Angeles, 18,304 and Los Angeles, the Crenshaw District, 64, Los Angeles, Baldwin Hills, 115. And um, pretty much as um, Dr. Amos has, sa has said, um, you know, COVID-19 has had a, a, a really tremendous impact on uh, color, on uh, communities of color. And despite insurance gains, there remains uh, health challenges and uh, that tend to impact African Americans disproportionately. And uh, the lack of Medicaid expansion in key states, health disparities and healthcare provider shortages makes it hard to address healthcare needs in a comprehensive manner. Studies show that our patients tend to do better when they have providers and nurses that look like them and culturally sensitive and appropriate care is still pretty much lacking in uh, the United States. According to the US Department of Health and Human Services, 58% of the African-American population live in the South. And I know Dr. Green Amos uh, bought uh, some st statistics regarding Louisiana and um, 
Mississippi rural uh, places. But a lot of statistics are also showing that the states of Texas, Florida, and Georgia pretty much have the highest uh, share of uninsured patients. And, uh, and that's pretty much because uh, Medicaid in the South uh, has not been expanded. A lot of governors in the, in the South, for whatever reason, uh, have not expanded Medicare. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Natalie. Okay, as far as uh, Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, these are statistics that were taken or as of uh, May the 18th. So the laboratory confirmed cases of, of COVID in Los Angeles County, as of May 18, 36,019 uh, cases. Uh, Long Beach, 1,271 cases. Pasadena, 684 cases. As far as uh, race and ethnicity, LA County cases, African Americans, 1,580 Native Indian, Alaska Native, 27 Asians, 2,480 uh, 2, Hispanic or Latinos, 12,467 Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, 256 whites, 4,514 and people that are under investigation, 13,153. And as far as deaths go in Los Angeles County, uh, as of May the 18th, African Americans, 207, American Indian, Alaska Natives, two, Asians, 299, Hispanic Latinos, 653, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, 16, and whites, 493. That concludes uh, my, what I have to say for right now. Okay, thank okay. you so, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Marion White. Um, okay. Really appreciate uh, those uh, statistics. So now I would like to kind of ask you some questions that, um, you know, uh, both from, you know, our audience and, uh, you know, just some questions that, that I have. Uh, so first, um, I would like to find out, you know, there are, there are those in the Black community that are distrustful of the data that says that COVID-19 is affecting more Black people than any other race. Some are thinking that this is a ploy to conduct human experimentation. What would you say to those in the Black community that are distrustful of the data that is out there, kind of like the data that, that, you, uh, that you just mentioned? Uh, pretty much, I would say to them, I know that there's a lot of mistrust as far as African Americans go. Uh, you know, when you think of the Tuskegee experiments, uh, you know, where African American uh, men were injected with syphilis. So we know that there's a lot of mistrust, but uh, believe me, and I, I want uh, Dr. Green Amos to jump in as well too. Uh, COVID, I mean, I've been on the front line and I've seen the impact uh, that the disease has had. And, um, you know, I know when the disease first surfaced, a lot of friends, we were saying, oh, it's not gonna impact any uh, African-Americans. And as you know, we can see by the data, African-Americans have really been impacted. African-Americans as well as Hispanics have been uh, really negatively impacted by the disease. So um, I know, I know, I have several nurses who, who work with me who have had family members. One of my uh, supervisors, her, um, both parents uh, succumbed to uh, COVID-19. So I would say to them, it's real. It's definitely real. Absolutely. And, and, I completely, and I completely echo what was just shared by Professor Thornton White. Um, my practices are in epicenters of minority communities, Compton, Long Beach, and Downey. So most of you, regardless of where you live in the United States, are familiar with Compton, California, as being a place that is um, historically a black and brown community, at least over the last number of decades. And what I'm seeing, unfortunately, is a social and wealth gap um, alongside with the racial and ethnic diversity that we're seeing. 
So for my population, I do mostly geriatrics. My senior patients who are mostly African-American who've been staying safe at home have not been adversely affected. But those of my patients who are younger, who have essential duties and essential responsibilities, I have quite a few that work in the postal carrying industry, work for FedEx, work in the grocery stores, they have been affected. My first patient to test positive for COVID-19 works at a local community senior facility. And so he works very close to us in another community um, in Southern California and Los Angeles. And he was exposed because there was an outbreak at his nursing facility where he worked. So imagine he knew he was positive because the entire staff was tested. He had to come home and tell his wife and his children that they indeed had to be on quarantine for two weeks. You can't go anywhere. That's what he had to tell them. You cannot go anywhere. This disease is real. This disease is real. Thankfully, he had minimal symptoms. Thankfully, he does not have a number of comorbid conditions. And he was able to get through the experience with just a few days of supportive treatment that I was able to provide him. But the reality around this disease is that for those who are essential workers, for those people who have to go out and handle the business affairs of our society, while many of us get to have the luxury, if we're able to work from home, uh, those are the people who are most adversely affected. This is why you're seeing black and brown folks throughout the country having these rates. And also, again, as I have to reiterate, the first groups and large groups of cases, especially in Southern California and on the West Coast, excuse me, West Coast, happen in senior residential facilities where there are a lot of people of color. Um, Professor White showed some statistics specifically around Los Angeles, and the case rate in Latinos is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. 12,000 cases, where we're talking about hundreds of cases, maybe 2,000 cases in the African American community, and 3,000 cases in the Latino community. Asians are also seeing incredibly high numbers. So this is not something that is just affecting us, though it is affecting us disproportionately. It's affecting those people who have to be out in the community. Those people who unfortunately are living or residing in places where there's an outbreak. And unfortunately, when we look at what's happened in these skilled nursing facilities, a lot of it has been because staff members were not symptomatic and unfortunately passed the virus from patient to patient. So we see places like even in our jail centers, in our juvenile detention centers, where there are more staff members than actual inmates or individuals residing that have the virus because they're asymptomatic. But now because of testing, we can identify who those people are and keep them from affecting those populations. But again, when we come into our communities and we work and then have to come home, we're bringing the virus oftentimes to our family members. So another community of individuals that's been affected are multi-generation livers. So people, for example, who, ha who are maybe 65, 70, 75 years of age, but they have children who are going out into the community. They're bringing the virus home, and then the elderly in those homes are being affected. And again, this is majorly what we see in African-American, Latino, and Asian communities throughout the United States. And you know what, too, just wanted to also add that, you know, we know that poverty, uh, income inequality, wealth inequality uh, plays a role, as well as uh, food insecurity. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, we have here in Los Angeles County in particular, we have a large uh, homeless population. And, you know, when the COVID-19 uh, epidemic or pandemic broke out, you know, that was one of the current concerns that we had was, uh, you know, how were we going to take care of those uh, homeless patients? So uh, it's not a joke. It's yeah. not a joke. Right. Well, uh, let's uh, take a, a question from, from our audience. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, medical, many medical professionals and analysts are saying people of color are dying from COVID because of underlying health issues. But others are saying the disparity is due to people of color being denied testing. Is that true? Well, uh, let me- You, you gotta go that one. Now. Yes. Oh, you can no Yeah, let oh. me speak on that one. So, um, this is a virus that does not have a cure. This is a virus that does not have a specific aligned treatment. So remember, this is not a bacteria. This is not something we can provide an antibiotic for. 
This is something that we provide supportive care for. So for example, in the early days of this pandemic, in early March, in mid-March, I had lots of people who were hearing what was going on and requesting to be tested, yet they had no symptoms, they had no problems, no issues, no concerns. I could not say, for example, if those individuals had not been exposed to the virus, because now in retrospect, we know people were exposed as early as January in California, and maybe even December. The reality is that 85% of individuals will recover from this virus without having any symptoms. So if indeed we're looking at treating people in the best way, yes, at this point, we have access to more testing and individuals can be tested. If they're in Southern California, they can be tested without any uh, symptoms. In other parts of the country, they have individual testing platforms and protocols. But the reality is there's way more testing available today. However, again, most individuals, an overwhelming number, 85% or more, will not have any symptoms at all. So the disease state that happens is related to how strong our immune systems are able to combat this virus. If indeed we have strong immune systems, we may have no symptoms. If we have strong immune systems, we may have mild symptoms that last for just a few days or a week or so, and supportive treatment, including Tylenol and maybe medicine that we call antitussives to help to control the coughing and the chest discomfort and such that may happen from the symptoms, as well as I should mention the digestive symptoms. I can tell you that initially in this virus, we were focusing on fever, cough, and chills. Fever, cough, and chills. But what we know now is that a lot of individuals presented early with digestive symptoms. Um, dyspepsia, what we call stomach upset or diarrhea, uh, those kinds of things are actually also very much associated with the COVID-19 uh, COVID virus. So again, if persons have those symptoms, we as physicians have to treat the symptoms because there is no cure, there is no specific treatment, but what we have to do is what we call supportive care. We have to treat as aggressively as we can those diseases and those diseases, meaning if someone has asthma or someone has hypertension or someone has diabetes, we need to control those diseases. And if they are having symptoms, then we must do an aggressive job in helping to control the symptoms. So one of the things that my team has done is make sure that any patient who needs refills on their medication, say they're asthmatic or have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we were very aggressive in the early stages of this virus to make sure individuals had nebulizer treatments, they had their inhalers, they had antibiotics on call if indeed they developed something that might seem like it could be bacterial. Again, not specifically for the COVID-19, but to protect those individuals from having other types of issues. So the idea was to control as much of the symptoms and those other comorbid conditions, giving those immune systems of those individuals times to perhaps treat and combat the problem. But again, unfortunately, we do not have a specific targeted treatment to combat this virus. This is why vaccinations in the near future will become such an important part of the way the COVID-19 pandemic will um, display itself. Thank you. The, um, th there's a really great question, and it was funny because I actually had this question myself, uh, Professor uh, Marion White, when you were uh, going through the, the statistics. And one of the questions that we have from our audience is, why, why is the under-investigation number so high? The under-investigation number? Yeah. Uh, it's high because those are people who present to facilities who have tested, but the results have not come back. And so they're considered under investigation. And as uh, Dr. Green Amos, she mentioned some of the symptoms, some of the things that we uh, tell people to watch for uh, as far as COVID-19, cough, a shortness of breath, uh, with difficulty breathing, fever, chills, muscle pain, sore throat, and uh, something, the diarrhea is, is uh, something that they relatively added as well as a new loss of taste or smell. And pretty much so, we're pretty much telling uh, patients, as uh, Dr. Green Amos said, you know, if the symptoms are mild, they can go home. And uh, if the if this condition worsens, like they have difficulty breathing, we're having them uh, to come into the hospital setting, so. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one of uh, something that has been uh, popping up in the news recently, I would say maybe in about the last week, uh, is about uh, Kawasaki disease in, in children. Uh, so we've heard recent reports about unusual presentations of Kawasaki-like disease and an inflammatory cis, uh, syndrome associated with COVID-19 in children. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about this? I don't know, Dr. Green Amos, if you have some information uh, about this. Absolutely. So the actual term is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or pediatric multi-system inflammatory cis, uh, syndrome also known as PMIS. This is a, a new presentation of a Kawasaki-like inflammatory disorder. So Kawasaki's disease is something that affects children overwhelmingly, and it is something that causes a very severe and extremely um, deadly viral uh, syndrome that affects mostly the cardiovascular system. So mostly their heart, they end up having heart failure, respiratory failure, and the sequela. This is something that has been reported and reported across the country. Unfortunately, just two days ago, a young girl in Baltimore, Maryland died from this particular disorder. So what we're knowing is that it's been associated with COVID-19. So far, the individual cases, uh, and we've had a few cases in California, just four cases here in Southern California, but the cases that have been identified mostly in New York City, there was about 25 cases in New York, and now again, we're seeing cases in multiple states. It is very similar to Kawasaki's, but it's a presentation of extreme COVID-19 sequela in children. And the reason why it's so concerning is because a lot of the misinformation, again, is suggesting that children have not been affected by this virus. Well, children have absolutely been affected by the virus. And the challenge is that many children are also having such strong immune systems that their symptoms may be mild or minimal or absent. They may not have any symptoms, but in the few unlucky children who've been exposed to COVID-19 and developed this syndrome, it can be fatal. So again, it's the pediatric multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome. And again, it is something that is becoming more of a very challenging disorder to address in children who've been positive for COVID-19. To, you to add to that, oh, I'm sorry, Professor White. Would you no, like just wanted to add, you know, I was looking at some statistics also uh, regarding uh, the syndrome and it was interesting, you know, in the case, I, I guess the syndrome first presented in the UK and um, the kids who uh, presented with this with the syndrome were all uh, Afro uh, Caribbean, which yes. was interesting to yes. me. Yes. So you know, I don't know, uh, you know, why that correlation, but they were all Afro Caribbean right. children presented with it. So um, I don't know if we have any numbers on. We can the talk about that. Here. Yeah. Yeah, it goes back to the same challenges that we're experiencing in the right. U.S. Okay, so you think about the Afro-Caribbean community in Europe. Most mm -hmm. of the people that work in service-related professions, right. in Great Britain in particular, my family has heritage. We have, like Natalie, the same. Yep. Right? We have family <laughs> members who are yeah. West Indian and live in Europe, especially in London. And what they have are many times blue-collar professions or nursing professions professions that make them essential workers. They're bringing the virus home. Their children are exposed, especially, again, you look at the timeline for this, um, their children are exposed. And then unfortunately, their children may have these manifestations. So we talk about what's going on in the, in the global consciousness. We have to think about racism and social economic barriers that contribute to white people of color throughout the world not just in the U.S., but, and not just in Southern California, and not just in the rural South, but oh. the way that we have been as a culture and a community disenfranchised, had less access to care, even in a place like in Europe, in London, where they have universal health care, yet you're still seeing individuals of a certain ethnicity or a racial group being highly identified to have a horribly fatal disorder. Again, it goes back to um, years, centuries of racism mm -hmm. and what racism has done to communities of color throughout the world and why we as a community are struggling to get access to care in the same way that others would and of course also the fiscal impact of having 
barriers that will not allow you to succeed despite your hard work. Yeah. So to, to add to that, uh, Dr. Green Amos, are there certain children that are more at risk for developing uh, this Kawasaki-like syndrome than others? Well, you know, that part we have not been able to see. There's been such few cases. So there hasn't been a consistency around any health ailments or diseases identified in these young people, uh, specifically looking at the cases in, in both California and Maryland. Uh, there have not been a specific trend as far as diseases affecting these individuals. As I mentioned previously in the adult population associated with the most extreme adverse outcomes, including death, the greatest and unfortunately, the most consistent uh, comorbidity was obesity. So if nothing else, we talk about how the pandemic has pushed so many of us closer and closer to our refrigerators. We need to <laughs> I feel attacked here. <laughs> because then, now, you know, this is, you know, we all struggle. Okay? We all struggle. And so what has happened, you know, you're sitting at home, you're getting uh, Uber Eats or, you know, here we're getting all kind of delivery. And if we're not getting delivery, we might go to the supermarket. And like I one day hadn't been out in two weeks and I was just, just really enjoying being at the supermarket. I really hate the supermarket, but I was just all up in the aisles, just looking with my mask and gloves, of course. But the point I'm trying to make is that, um, you know, we spend a lot more time focusing on food than we do on our regular activities, and thus people are certainly seeing an increase in their weight. But the, just to be, you know, make it a little lively here, but the reality is obesity, unfortunately, is the greatest risk factor that we've seen consistently in cases, but there has not been a specific comorbidity or disease state identified in the pediatric population that has led to this adverse uh, outcome uh, known as PIMSIS. But again, so few cases thus far, but something for us to be aware of. Yeah, thank you for, for that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you know, I've been reading a lot lately, um, and this has uh, come up in the chat as well, is about this whole idea of, of vitamin D, especially when it comes to, to our communities, right? That we tend to be vitamin D deficient. So does vitamin D really help in, in fighting uh, COVID-19 or, or helping your immune system with not getting COVID-19? Well, I will say no. Vitamin D has benefits for sure with your, um, how can I say, feeling of mood, your mood and your happiness and your joy and your overall disposition. Vitamin D has been shown to help people's disposition in general, but there has been no evidence that vitamin D or any other vitamin uh, or supplement would help protect individuals specifically against COVID-19. What we do know are there are some recommendations that generally one would prescribe or provide for people who are looking to ensure that their immune system is stable and balanced. But those things include what we always talk about in the medical community, uh, a healthy diet with fruits and vegetables, daily exercise, and lots of water. But there's not a specific um, vitamin or supplement that has been proven to be effective in combating this virus. You know what I was gonna add to uh, Natalie, uh, you know, the virus is, uh, is such a new virus you know, uh, information is changing on a daily basis. So, you know, what might have applied when it first um, surfaced doesn't apply now. So I always recommend a lot of, you know, everyone to check the professional uh, sources, the CDC, the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization to, to get your information. So, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Green Amos stated earlier, we have been getting so much misinformation from uh, our president. And, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, so many people listen to him and, you know, they do things without uh, getting advice from medical professionals. So, you know, I always encourage people to go to uh, the professional resources to get information. And Professor White, I just have to echo that 125,000%. Uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, though they have to pivot constantly, when new information is brought to our attention, um, the CDC was telling us last year that we were gonna have a really, really difficult flu season. Didn't necessarily identify what that was about, but again, the CDC is aware of a lot of things and, and tries to be very sensitive to providing accurate and informative 
um, news and information for the communities to be aware of, all of our communities. And they have done a very good job, again, being sensitive to all the changes and guidelines that unfortunately have to evolve because this is a new virus. But also the World Health Organization, I mean, they have provided such incredibly strong content. And it's just unfortunate that our national leader has failed to respond to the information that was shared early on about what might be happening based on the precedents in other communities and other communities throughout the world. So to your point, a lot of information, um, a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, has been shared. And the CDC is a source of truth. Your local county Department of Health uh, Department of Public Health, excuse me, is also a source of truth when you're trying to find out exactly what's happening in your community. Again, all of us who are in the medical profession are trying to help our patients as best we can and help our communities as best we can. But the source of truth, unfortunately, cannot come from our national leaders because unfortunately they are acting on their own individual biases and not following any prudent guidance around public health or even traditional guidelines around health and safety. I mean, some of the information that has been shared over the last few months is just, is outrageous. And to know that just in the last week or two that um, the President of the United States started taking hydroxychloroquine, which can cause significant cardiac arrhythmias, significant disease, and has been over and over again proven to not be an effective preventive tool at all, but yet he's taking it just because he feels like he can, is again another great source of misinformation and misguidance. So we're hopeful that people do not heed um, his particular perspective and think that hydroxychloroquine or any other medicine that has been available or spoken of in the general community. Those things are not to be used outside of clinical trials and are certainly not to be used outside of inpatient settings where monitoring can occur to ensure fatal arrhythmias, which are essentially where your heart rate uh, starts to speed up and can cause a sudden death, that those things do not occur. Thank you. So now I would like to uh, kind of uh, switch gears for a second and uh, kind of go into a little round robin segment, if you will indulge me. Um, so I want to read off a set of statements and I want you to tell me true or false. Okay. Uh, number one, the flu vaccine will protect you. False. <laughs> the flu vaccine will not protect against COVID-19. There is no vaccine for COVID-19. Even though, again, we've heard the president compare COVID-19 to the flu, it is a totally different virus. The flu is a virus, so is COVID-19. But the shot that you take for, uh, for influenza or the flu will not protect you uh, against the COVID-19. As a matter of fact, there is no vaccine available for COVID-19. Yes, thank you. The virus will go away during the summer. False. <laughs> so I wish the virus would just go away during the summer. Not the case. As you know, there was a concern perhaps in the beginning of this, oh, that the warmer temperature is gonna kill the virus. Well, not that kind of warmer temperature. Unfortunately, we are still going to be dealing with this virus. People have talked about the potential of a second wave in the early fall to fall season. And in Southern California, that is our hottest time of year. Uh, yeah. We tend to have the hottest weather here, September, October. So again, unfortunately, this is not going away. COVID-19 created inequities among those in the black community. Well, yeah. yeah, so it all comes back to the same thing we've been talking about. Disproportionately, people of color have comorbidities and have to service uh, or have jobs that are essential and have service professions in many capacities. So because of that, there is that inequity. Uh, the disease itself that the person may have prior to being exposed to a virus like COVID-19 is really the underlying issue if someone is compromised. But there are still individuals who have no known historical medical condition and unfortunately develop the virus and unfortunately pass on from it. So I think that's a loaded question, but I would say in general, the reality is that uh, what this has done, this virus has brought to light 
that inequities exist in our community. I don't think any of us on the panel or any of us in the audience did not think that was already the case. But for people who were not um, aware, perhaps, yeah. they weren't aware that this country is unfortunately built on a history of racism and a history of uh, concerns regarding how individuals have been treated, especially people of color, and especially those whose, whose ancestors had been enslaved. Okay. You know what, I think, I think um, uh, Natalie, we need to really take a closer look at the whole comorbidity issue, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it really has a negative impact on uh, African American communities. And I think we need to, in particular, the, the uh, issue with obesity. Uh, so, you know, that maybe that's something for another webinar, but we need to look at that because, you know, those comorbidities are killing us as a people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for, 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 I mean, it's a wealth of information that, that we've got today. And I'm sure that we could have really stayed on a whole other hour. Cause I mean, there's so many other questions that um, folks had in the chat and other questions that I had, but um, thank you so much for, for lending your expertise uh, to this discussion today. Um, we, this was really, really invaluable. So thank you. We are, um, we are living in unprecedented times and we know that this is a rapidly changing situation. Uh, so like was mentioned before, if you're ever in doubt, always check reputable sources such as uh, the World Health Organization, CDC, and uh, local organizations like for us uh, in LA, the LA County Department of uh, Public Health. Um, as you can see on the screen, our health experts have taken the liberty of curating a list of resources for you. And we encourage you to explore these websites further for more information on COVID-19. Um, you know, please consider the information that you've uh, been shared with today and use this opportunity to educate others in our respective communities so we can continue to flatten the curve. We know that sharing knowledge, not myth, is the best way to preserve our community and our world. So we, we must do our part. So I implore all of you to do yours. Uh, just quickly transitioning into next week, uh, I encourage you to join us for the finale of the Coping in Quarantine Linked Together webinar series. It will be next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific standard time. And this one will be called Smart Money Moves during COVID-19. We will have a senior financial advisor from Wealth Management Financial Advisors, Ms. Marie Derry, to discuss the best ways to recession-proof our cash and shore up our finances against long-term economic instability. This event will be moderated by our very own Lynx member, Ms. Allison Walker, who is Vice President of Operations for Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles. The registration information will be posted on our website as well as our social media pages uh, as of tonight. So please look out for that. Um, before we part for this evening, I would just like to take a moment to thank our amazing uh, tech wizards behind the green curtain, as I like to call it, Ms. Nicole Bell Mitchell, as well as Dr. Gail Ball Parker, and a special thank you to the Emergency Response Committee, who has been actively engaged since day one when we formed this committee and has been so incredibly instrumental in bringing this series to fruition. Lastly, I would also like to thank uh, the president of the Harbor Area Chapter, Dr. Valerie Green Amos, also our panelists for today, for your incredible leadership. As a reminder, upon the uh, conclusion of this webinar, there will be a link to the survey that you will see when, once you end uh, this uh, webinar uh, for you to fill out. So we really look forward to uh, receiving your feedback, okay? And uh, lastly, on behalf of the Harbor Area Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you for watching. God bless, stay safe, and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.